And I want to continue to talk about dwelling in the presence of God. I thought that this morning was just awesome with Arthur and um, Barry and what we're teaching here. It was just great. And Barry really, really helped me. God raised him up to help me and he helped me. It was good. But we were just talking about the presence of God. If you've missed any of that, I'd encourage you to get that little USB and to get these uh, lessons because this is the kind of thing that you have to go over and over and it has to become a part of a lifestyle. It can't just be something you hear one time. But I've been talking about uh, that you have to dwell in the presence of God. So much of God's blessing and supply and just everything that he wants to do in our life is dependent upon us dwelling in him. Uh, Barry, just that was powerful out of uh, 1 Timothy or 2 Timothy chapter 2 about us opposing ourselves. God gives us these things, but you can do things that will oppose yourself and stop God's blessing from manifesting in your life. This morning, I talked a lot about how the scripture just talks about how that he's with us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And I want to use this passage here in Luke chapter 24 to illustrate this. This is resurrection day. The first few verses of Luke 24 are about the women who went to the tomb and found the stone rolled away and that Jesus was gone and they had a vision of angels. And um, so after this, this is still on that same day. It says, starting with verse 13, this is Luke 24, 13. And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about three score furlongs. That's seven miles. And they talked together of all of these things which had happened. Now notice what they were talking about. They were talking about the resurrection. They were talking about the reports that Jesus was raised from the dead. But it says in verse 15, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. And their eyes were holding that they should not know him. Now get a picture of this. These are two of the disciples. It doesn't tell us exactly which ones they are. One of them was named Cleopas. And uh, that could have been an uncle of Jesus because Jesus... Uh, aunt was named Mary and her husband was named Cleopas. They were talked about. And so, but it's possible, but you know, we don't know if there was more than one Cleopas, so we don't know for sure. And then it talks about when they go back to the rest of the group, they said, the Lord hath appeared unto Simon. And it implies that one of these people was named Simon. Uh, we don't know for sure if that was Simon Peter. I have no way of knowing, but regardless of whether these are some of the notable people in the Bible, um, they were disciples. And they were some of the inner circle because after this appearance, they went back to Jerusalem and were immediately received into that inner group. So they were either one of the, some of the 11 uh, disciples, the apostles of Jesus that were left, or they were certainly in that uh, second group of 70 that were sent out or something. They were some of the very close ones that had known Jesus throughout his ministry. And yet here they are talking about the resurrection Jesus comes and walks with them. And instead of this causing joy and rejoicing, because here's Jesus walking with him, they didn't even recognize him. That's astounding to me. And did you know that this is not unique? I, I forget now, I think that there's 14 resurrection appearances listed in scripture. And you have to, uh, like for instance, this, study Bible that I have, the four gospels, you've got to arrange the uh, gospels in chronological order to come up with that because they, many repeat the same thing. But I've been able to identify, I think 14 different times that Jesus appeared to people after his resurrection. And in every instance, sometimes it's more subtle than others, but in every instance, the people didn't recognize him. Most people haven't thought about that, but it's obvious right here. These are some of his inner circle, maybe not the 11, but some of the ones who knew him very well had been with him for years and they didn't recognize him. You can turn over. Let me just, I'll be back to this, but turn over to John chapter 21 and let me show you this instance. 
In John chapter 21, this is uh, Jesus told his disciples that he would appear to them again. And so they went into Galilee and uh, Peter said, I'm going fishing. And the other said, we'll go fishing with you. So they were out fishing and they had uh, caught nothing. They had fished all night long. And in verse four, it says, but when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Now, some people could say that this was because he was on the shore and they were in the boat. It was a long ways off and they just didn't recognize him. But as the story goes through, you'll see that when they got face to face with him, they still didn't recognize him. And it says, uh, they knew not that it was Jesus. And in verse five, then Jesus said unto them, children, have you any meat? And they answered him, no. And he said unto them, cast the net on the right side of the ship and you shall find. They cast, therefore, now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that's talking about John, the one who wrote this, said unto Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fisher's coat unto him, for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were, 200 cubits, dragging, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid there on in bread. Jesus said unto them, bring of the fish, which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 150 and three. And for all there were so many yet was not the net broken. Then Jesus said unto them, come and dine. And look at this in verse 12. And none of the disciples durst ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Why would they even put that in there? Because they didn't recognize him by looking at him. But they knew him by his actions. You know, in the fifth chapter of the book of Luke, Jesus did this exact same thing at the beginning of his ministry. Before he had called them to be his disciples, the crowds were pressing on him. And so he entered into Simon's boat and he said, cast out a little ways from the land. And he taught him. And then after he got through teaching him, he says, let's go out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. And they said, we've been fishing all night long and we hadn't caught a single thing. Nevertheless, at your word, we will let down the net. Notice he's, Jesus said, let down the nets, plural. They said, we, we, been working all night, didn't catch anything. We'll let down the net, singular. Boy, there's a great message in that. We don't prepare for the abundance that God really wants us to have. And one of the reasons God doesn't give us the abundance is because we didn't prepare for it. We prepared for failure and that limits what God can do. You got to take the limits off God. So he had already done something similar to this. And when they saw this great catch of fish, they recognized by the way he had dealt with them and the miraculous results who it was. And then when they were sitting right across from him in this, with his fire, they were looking at him in the face, not more than just a few feet away. Nobody dared to ask him who he was, knowing that it was the Lord. Why would they even say that? It's because they didn't know him by sight. They knew him by his actions, by in their heart. They knew who it was. And again, you can go through every instance. Mary Magdalene on the resurrection day, Jesus appeared unto her and she thought he was the gardener. And he says, tell me where you've taken my Lord, what you've done with him. And he said, Mary. And he called his, her name in a way that she had heard before. And she turned and said, Rabboni. And then it, you can tell the same thing happened all the way through. Let me turn over and look at this verse in Matthew chapter 28. This to me is kind of a, a conclusive proof that they had trouble recognizing because in Matthew chapter 28, I read these verses this morning. These are some of the very last words that Jesus said to his disciples right before he was caught up into heaven. And it says in Matthew chapter 28 and in verse 16, it says, then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Some who? It says it was the 11, verse 16. These are his 12 apostles. Judas was dead at this time. He had committed suicide. And this is Simon Peter, John, 
uh, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, all of this 11 people that had lived with him 24 seven for three and a half years. Some of these 11 were looking at Jesus face to face and doubting that it was Jesus. That's amazing. You know, many people think that if I could just see, if I would have been one of Jesus' disciples, man, I'd have been a believer. You know, it's much, much easier on us than it was on them. I don't have the words to really explain this. I've tried two or three times and it never seems to come out right. But look over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I'm coming back to Luke here in just a minute. You need to ask the Holy Spirit to help you to get what I'm saying because like I said, I don't think like I've ever said it real good. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, of course, verse 17 is a verse I use a lot. But in verse uh, 16, Paul said, Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. And then he goes on to say the reason for this is because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. Another way of saying this is that he doesn't know people just based on their physical things, how tall they are, what color they are, whether they're male or female. He knew people spirit to spirit. He had learned to judge people not based on the color of their skin or the way they clothe themselves or thin, anything like this, but he knew people in the spirit realm. And he was saying that at one time he knew Jesus after the flesh. Now, Paul never was one of the 12 apostles. He was a student of Gamaliel and he was actually one of the Pharisees that persecuted Christians even to the point of death. But it is inconceivable that anybody living in Jerusalem, a Pharisee who hated what Jesus was doing, it's inconceivable that they never saw Jesus. Jesus caused a huge stir. Everybody in Jerusalem knew who he was. And it often says that the Pharisees and the scribes were at Jesus meetings mocking him. I, I believe that Paul had seen Jesus and that's what he's making reference to. He says, at one time I knew Jesus after the flesh. He could have told you exactly how tall he was, how long his hair was, what color his eyes were, his mannerisms. He knew him after the flesh at one time, but he says, now we don't know him that way anymore. And knowing God after the flesh is actually a hindrance to knowing who he really is. Did you know that when Jesus walked on this earth, he was sinless. He was the son of God. But he had a human body. It was a sinless human body, but it was human. He got tired. He sweat. Jesus smelled. Jesus had to take a bath. Jesus had to go to the bathroom. I'm sure Jesus, you know, he didn't stay in a Holiday Inn every night. His hair wasn't always perfect. I'm sure his hair got dirty and matted at times. I'm sure that, you know, he didn't have a change of clothes. He didn't send things out to the laundry. And I'm sure that his clothes were dirty. When you looked at Jesus, it took faith to believe that this was God because he was so human. Most people have never thought about this. And we think, oh, I wished I could have been one of those disciples. It would have been hard to believe Jesus was God because you watched him and you could smell him. And he got tired and he had to go to sleep. The Bible says that God says, I am the Lord, I slumber not. And yet you see a man who is God and yet he's sleepy and he's tired and he smells and he's hungry and, he's, and you have to do things for him. It would have been hard to be one of Jesus' disciples and look past that flesh and see who he really was. And yet when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, the 17th chapter of Matthew, you know what he did when he got into his father's presence, he just in a sense, this body was like a curtain that kept people from seeing the true glory of God. All of the stuff that uh, Barry was saying this morning about the Ark of the Covenant and that power, and you know that word picture about the 
uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark and how powerful this ark was and killed all of these people and stuff. All of that was inside of Jesus. All of the glory of God, but it was wrapped in human flesh like it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, I believe it's around verse 16, that we have this treasure in earthen vessel. Jesus had an earthen vessel. He had, and it, that earthen vessel blocked who he really was. It was hard for people to recognize who he was because he was so human. But when he got on the Mount of Transfiguration and got into the presence of his father, it's like he just pulled this curtain back. And all of a sudden light radiated from him. It didn't reflect off of him as it did with Moses when Moses was in the presence of the Lord and it says his face shone and reflected it. Jesus radiated. He just, it came out of him. All of the glory of God. He was God manifest in the flesh. First Timothy chapter, uh, what? One or three, 16 something. That great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. The only time God was manifest in the flesh was with Jesus. Jesus was God, but it just hindered people from seeing it. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, the glory of God shone out. Did you know that at the Last Supper, John put his head over on Jesus' chest and leaned on his chest, which there was nothing wrong with that. Man, Jesus loved John, John loved Jesus, and they had a great relationship, but he had this intimacy with God because he wasn't intimidated because Jesus was in this physical body. But did you know in the first chapter of the book of Revelation, G uh, John saw Jesus again, but this time he was in his glory. And his hair was white as snow. His eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like brass that was in a furnace. They were burning and radiating. And when John saw Jesus in Revelation chapter one, he fell at his feet as if he was dead. Did you know that that was the same Jesus that he laid his head on his chest at the Last Supper? Jesus hadn't changed except in this physical body. He now had a glorified body, but he was just as glorious. He was just as powerful, but it was contained in this earthen vessel. And anyway, this is what Paul is talking about, that we knew Jesus one time after the flesh, but now we don't know him that way anymore. We know him by the spirit. You have to perceive Jesus spirit to spirit, not in some physical fleshly way. And the reason I'm bringing all of this out is to say that this is why most people do not live and dwell, abide in the presence of God because to put it very bluntly, we're carnal. The word carnal doesn't necessarily mean sinful. All sin is carnal, but you can be carnal without being a sinner. Carnal just means of the five senses is what it means. The literal word Carne, uh, we, it's where we get carne from. When we say chili con carne, the word carnal, carne means meat. It just means meat. Like uh, the uh, strong says it means flesh as stripped of skin. In other words, not your physical epidermis, but you're just the meat of your body. That's what the word carnal means. So when you call somebody carnal minded, you're calling them a meathead. Amen. <laughs> But when we're carnal, it just means that we are controlled by our five senses. We are dominated by what we see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And the carnal mind, it says, man, I'm quoting so many scriptures. Just for time's sake, I'm going to quote this. You can find it. But it's over in Romans chapter 8. It's around verse 5, somewhere like that. The carnal mind is not subject to God. Neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, the word flesh and carnal are used interchangeably often. They that are in the flesh cannot please God. It goes right along with John chapter four, verse 24, that God is a spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and not in the flesh. You have to worship him in spirit and in truth. And this is why so many people don't connect with God is because they're used to a goosebump. They're used to uh, something special. They are always looking for the spectacular and they miss God in the everyday things. People miss Jesus because he was so human, but inside in the spirit, he was the glory of God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. 
Hebrews chapter one, verse three, that he is the express image of the father, a perfect representation, identical to the father. And Paul said, we used to know him by the flesh, but now we have to know him by the spirit. These disciples on the road to Emmaus were talking about Jesus. They were talking about his resurrection. Jesus, the one who they longed to see was walking with them and talking to him and they couldn't recognize him. Not because he was in a different body, because later in this same day, after these disciples go back to Jerusalem and they're telling everybody, we saw him, he walked with us on the road to Emmaus. Jesus appeared in the midst of them. And he told Thomas, he said, I mean, not Thomas, but uh, that was eight days later, but he told that group of people right then, he says, touch me and feel because a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as you see me have. And so he says, touch me. He was real. It wasn't like he was in a different form. It's not like his body had changed. And eight days later, he told Thomas, he says, stick your finger into the print of the nails, thrust your hand into my side and be not faithless, but believing. Jesus had the same body. Why didn't they recognize him? What was going on? Look at this. It says uh, in verse 15, and it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned. You know what reason is? That's when you're trying to figure it out with your brain. I can guarantee you when they heard the report of Jesus being alive from the dead, the Holy Spirit quickened that to them. I bet you there was excitement. That's the reason they were talking about it. They hadn't totally rejected it. The Lord was dealing with them, but their reasoning was getting in the way and their reasoning blinded them to who God really was. They were operating out of their brain. They were trying to recognize him by physical sight instead of letting their heart lead them. Again, I fail with words to be able to say what I'm trying to say. But you have to know God on a heart level. It can't be in just physical, natural things. I have people all the time say, if your son was raised from the dead, why don't you just give a doctor's report, prove it, go on television. Let's broadcast it to all of these television networks and let's just make people believe. That's not how it works. With the heart, man believes. You cannot argue a person into anything. I've had people with the same logic say if they've really been inside of Noah's Ark, there's a guy here in Woodland Park who's walked inside of Noah's Ark and has a, uh, some of it, a piece of the wood and stuff. And I've held a piece of that wood and they've tested it and they believe that it's the actual Noah's Ark. Why don't we prove it? You can't prove anything. You can't make, you can't argue a person into faith. With the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans chapter 10, verse 10. You can't argue a person. And yet most of us are trying to do things to argue people into these things. When it comes to creationism versus evolution, you know, we give a lot of physical facts. I've got a lot of teaching on that. I've had some scientists and people who are well-versed on my programs and we give enough physical facts to show people that when people say it's a fact that evolution, evolution is true, we can show you it is not a fact and you can prove that, but you can't argue a person into believing in creation. Matter of fact, people who believe in evolution, it's a faith deal. They don't have facts to stand on. It takes more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe in creation. Anyway, I'm not going to get off on that. But you can't argue people into anything. But see, they were trying to figure all this out with just their brain. They, and the scripture says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart. And lean not unto your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. You have to know God heart to heart. God is a spirit and to really worship him, you have to connect with him spirit to spirit. Paul was saying at one time I knew him in the flesh, but now I know him by the spirit. These disciples hadn't yet made that transition. They had heard about Jesus and they were trying to figure it out intellectually and they were trying to just see with their eyes. But it says uh, that they, their eyes were holden that they should not know him. That's in verse 16. Their eyes were holden that they should not know him. 
What held their eyes? This word holden means to grasp, to seize, to hold on to. What was it that kept their eyes from seeing? Keep your finger here because I'm going to come back, but look in Mark chapter 16. This is the same instance reported, but the whole instance is recorded in one verse. And so in Mark chapter um, 16 and in verse 12, it says, After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. That's the exact same thing that we were reading out of Luke but it's put in different words. Here it says that, that Jesus appeared in another form. What does that mean, another form? He was still human, so it wasn't some other kind of form other than human. And like I said, he later said, put your finger into the print of the nails. His body was still the same. He still had the marks of crucifixion. It wasn't that it didn't look the same and it wasn't recognizable. The thing that was different was it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14, it says that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God because they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Spiritual things have to be discerned by your spirit, not your brain, not physical proof. And God is a spirit. You have to worship him in spirit and in truth. Jesus at one time had a physical body and they knew him after the flesh. They knew him in the natural. They didn't know who he really was. They just knew his earthen vessel, but they related it. But now after he was resurrected from the dead, he didn't have a physical body. He had a glorified body. It was still tangible. He says you could touch it. He says you could put your finger into it. It still looked the same. But it, it was spiritual. And I don't even know exactly what I'm saying right here. <laughs> I don't understand that completely. But you could still recognize it because they saw him and you could put your finger into the print of the nails. It was still the same, but yet it wasn't the same. It was no longer limited. This same day, they went back and they told the other apostles and the doors were locked and all the windows were locked for fear of the Jews. And Jesus just showed up in the middle. His glorified body can go through things. Right here in this instance, when they finally recognized him, he just disappeared. He can appear and disappear. He could zip from place to place. It was still a body that you could touch. It was tangible. It wasn't just spirit because he even said a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as I have. It was tangible, but it wasn't physical. Whatever that means. It wasn't limited the way that our physical bodies were. And because of it, you had to spiritually discern him. And they couldn't spiritually discern Jesus. They were just looking for him in the physical. And the reason this is so powerful to me, the Lord spoke this to me, I don't know, 30 something years ago. And this has been one of my favorite things that God ever showed me. And the Lord showed me that he's with me just as real as if he was standing here in his physical body. Matter of fact, his spiritual, his glorified body is more real than a physical, tangible body. The spirit realm existed before this physical world existed. Spiritual realm is the parent force. The parent is greater than what it created. You can't create something greater than you. God created us and he is spirit. And the spirit realm is more real than this physical realm. And God lives in the spiritual realm. And we, when we were born again, it goes on to say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that we became a new creature. Old things passed away, all things became new. That isn't talking about your physical body. Your physical body is still the same body. If you were a man, you're still a man. If you're a woman, you're still a woman. If you were short, you're still short. If you were white, you're still white. If you're black, you're still black. Your body didn't change. Your mind didn't change. So what does it mean that when you're in Christ, old things have passed away, all things have become new? It's talking about in the spirit. In the spirit, you are a completely brand new person. One translation of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new species of being that never existed before. 
In the spirit, you are totally different. And we have capabilities in our spirit that go far beyond this physical realm. People who sit there and say, I just can't believe until I see it. You're just carnal. You're just limiting yourself to what you can see, taste, tear, smell, and feel. You're acting like you're nothing but just an evolved animal. But I'm telling you, people are different. We've got the spirit of God Almighty. And especially when you're born again, baptized in the Holy Spirit, you are power packed. Everything that Barry was talking about this morning that was in that box, the Ark of the Covenant is in you. The very presence and glory of God resides on the inside of you. It's in the spirit realm. And you have capabilities in the spirit that most people don't even believe exist, much less that they could walk in. But you can know things by the spirit. Man, I could get plum off here and go to giving you a lot of examples of what I'm talking about. I'm wanting to get back to this story. But the reason that they couldn't see him is because they were just trying to figure it out with their brain. They were using their five senses. They weren't letting their spirit man function. Plus, they weren't born again the same as you and I were. They weren't completely new. They didn't have this new birth yet. And so it was a little bit different for them. But uh, for us, there are many Christians today that still don't perceive God with them because they're just trying to discern him in some physical, natural way. But he has to be spiritually discerned. And like I was talking this morning, you need to write on your heart these truths. You need to try and grab hold of what I'm saying and say, Father, thank you that whether I can perceive it with any of my senses, whether there is any physical evidence or not, your word is proof. And I just write on my heart that you will never leave me nor forsake me, that you are here in all of your glory. You have to write on your heart that, man, I am full of God. The fullness of the Godhead dwells in me bodily. Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. I'm complete in him. As Jesus is, so am I in this world. 1 John chapter 4 verse 17. That I am created in righteousness and true holiness. Many people just go look in the mirror and they say that can't be true because you look at yourself and you see scars from your ungodliness. You see all kinds of things in your mind and in your emotions. You have scars of all of your problems and things that have happened. And most people only function in the carnal, physical, natural realm. And they just say, can't see it. But in the spirit, you are identical to Jesus. You have his life, his power. All of that's in you. God is with you constantly. And you have to write these things on your heart by speaking it out your mouth and believing it. So these disciples could not recognize Jesus because they were reasoning. They were in the natural. They were functioning from their mind instead of from their heart. And that's the reason they couldn't perceive him. Spiritual things, spiritual beings have to be discerned spiritually, not carnally, not physically. And so it says in verse 17, and he said, this is Jesus said unto them, what manner of communications are these that ye have one to another as ye walk and are sad? Now think about what they were talking about. They were talking about Jesus. They were talking about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. They were talking about the women who had said, we've been to the tomb. We saw a vision of angels and uh, Jesus is resurrected from the dead. They were talking about all of the right things, but they were talking about it in doubt and unbelief with the limitation of their physical minds. And boy, this is a great truth. For us to dwell in the presence of God, you've got, to, you've got to talk about that in faith and not in doubt and fear and all of these other things. One of the points I'm gonna make later this week is that you've gotta have the right impression of God. There are some people that constantly keep their mind stayed on God, but they believe God is angry at them and they bear that bitterness and hurt and shame and condemnation. It, if you're doing that, it's actually detrimental to have your mind stayed on God if you think that that's the way that God is because you're just constantly living in condemnation. These people had their mind on God. They were talking about the things of God, but they were talking about it in unbelief. You got to do this in faith or it doesn't do you any good. 
We got a lot of religious people today who do keep their mind stayed on God, but it's all unbelief, the things that they're saying. They're thinking the wrong things. So he says, what is this communication you're having? And you're sad. These men were sad. And one of them said, this is amazing to me. One of them said, whose name was Cleopas, answering said unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem, and knowest not the things which are come to pass in these days? And Jesus said, What things? <laughs> you know, the Lord will let you talk. <laughs> if you want to get in, just gripe and complain and spew out all of your problems and stuff, He'll let you talk. But it's amazing how we think that God just doesn't know what's going on. Nobody knew what had happened to Jesus as well as Jesus knew what had happened to him. And they're saying, man, you just don't know. We do the same thing. We go before the Lord. Oh God, the doctor said, and you feel like you've got to tell God every glory detail and let him know just how bad your situation is. God, did you hear what this person said about me? God, do you understand how critical my financial need is? Over in Matthew chapter six, when Jesus was teaching on prayer, he says that it's not to tell God what's going on because your father in heaven knows what you have need of before you ask. Prayer is not an opportunity to inform poor misinformed God of your situation. <laughs> and yet we do this all of the time. This is amazing to me how they are saying, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Don't you know what has happened? Man, Jesus knew he not only knew what had happened in the natural, he knew what happened after he died. He knew what had gone on for the last three days. And so um, he said, what things? And they began to say in verse 19, they said unto him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, which was a prophet, mighty indeed and word before God and all the people. You know, they were willing to call him a prophet, but they had backed off of him being the savior of the world, which they had made that confession. They said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God in uh, Matthew chapter 16. But now they backed off that confession because of the results that they were seeing. And in verse uh, 20, it says, and how the chief priest and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and have crucified him. But we trusted that it had been he which should have redeemed Israel. You know, the way they're talking about this is in the past tense, that their faith back then was this. But because of the death and the, res and the burial, uh, their faith had been shaken. And they said, and beside all of this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulcher. And when they found not his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulcher and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. That's talking about Peter and John who ran to the sepulcher and went in and um, found that the body was gone and saw this vision of angels. And then in verse 25, it's, then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Boy, there is so much in this. I have meditated on these verses thousands of hours. I just have to say some things and let you go flesh it out. But this is the resurrected Jesus. He is perfect. And he came to them to reveal himself unto them. He came to them because he loves them. He was trying to bless them. They were distressed and he came to help them. And yet here's the resurrected, all compassionate, loving God speaking to his disciples that he's trying to help. And he says, you fools. You're slow of heart to believe. Did you know that there's just a bunch of people, I'd say the majority of people today, that they would never say things like this because it's not sensitive. You're insensitive. You're being unkind. You got to be sweet and kind. Here's the resurrected Jesus saying, you fools. Slow of heart to believe. There was no malice in it, but they were foolish. He had prophesied to him 14 different times that he would be crucified and resurrected again. 14 separate times. And did you know that the unbelievers, the scribes and the Pharisees remembered the prophecies about his resurrection? That's why they said, put a watch there because we remember that he prophesied that he would rise the third day and we don't want his disciples to come and steal away the body and say that he was resurrected. The unbelievers remembered his prophecies, but his own disciples 
had forgotten all of the prophecies about him being resurrected from the dead. That's foolish. And Jesus said, you fools and slow of heart to believe. There was no malice. He wasn't mean, but it was foolish what they were doing. I personally, maybe it's just because of my personality type. God speaks to you, I guess, the way that you are or the way that you understand. But God has told me before, that's foolish. It's stupid. Quit doing that. I believe God will just tell you things sometimes. There's no malice on his part, but we do a lot of stupid stuff. Amen. <laughs> God will tell you you're stupid. <laughs> Amen. You know, we just are so, we become so touchy feely and so sensitive that if a person says you're fat, you get offended. You got to say, well, you're a little challenged in this area. No, you just, <laughs> you're fat. Amen. <laughs> you're short. You aren't vertically challenged, you're short. Get over it. Both your feet reach the ground, you're the perfect height, amen. But we got people that are just so sensitive about everything. The way that we, our society is developing to where you can't say or do anything without offending somebody is wrong. You need to toughen up. And a lot of it comes because we won't even let our kids compete anymore. There are no winners or losers. Everybody's a winner. It's not so. Some of us are losers. Amen. You don't have to stay a loser. You know, my granddaughter came home and she had a trophy for something. And, and my son Peter said, well, what did you win this for? He says, well, everybody got a trophy because we are all winners and he took it away from her. He says, that's not true. He says, you aren't all winners. There's some people that do better than others. And I think it's good for you to realize you aren't as good as you could be and it will inspire you to improve and get better. But we've got people now that you just can't stand the fact that something might be wrong with it. Some of us are just ugly. Some of us are fat and some of us are just other things. And you know what? You don't need to let it bother you. I mean, paint your barn, make it look as good as you possibly can. But it's the, it's the inner man that counts. There's some of us, there's some people that honestly, they just don't look very good, but they, they are awesome, lovely people. I'm thinking of somebody right now. I won't tell you who I'm thinking about. <laughs> But there's a minister friend of mine that this guy, I mean, he's just homely. And yet he's an awesome person and you can see his heart and it comes through and everybody just loves him. Get over it, amen. Go get one of those makeovers and look as good as you can and then just get with it. But you know what? We, Sometimes the Lord will just tell you things. He's telling you, oh, fools, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded unto them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Did you know how you get past your reasoning? You know how you get out of this carnal mode? To where I don't feel God with me. I just can't believe it if I don't feel it. You know how you get past that? You stick your nose in the word. He used the word to reveal it unto him. John chapter 6 verse uh, 63. Jesus said the flesh profits nothing. It's the spirit that quickens. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you. They are spirit. And they are alive. We put so much emphasis on the flesh. And I could spend hours on this, but we are becoming increasingly, even Christians, more and more carnal to where there is a physical, natural explanation for everything. We've now got to where, you know, nothing is your fault. It's your genes. You have a disposition to this and it's your environment that caused you to be this way. And stuff, and we're trying to find a physical, natural reason for everything. Did you know that around 50% of all of the healings that Jesus uh, produced were demons? They were cast out of people. Deafness, blindness, curvature of the spine was called a spirit of infirmity. 
and on and on and on you could go. Did you know a lot of things aren't physical? That's the reason that the doctors can't really find out how to deal with it because it may have a physical byproduct. It may affect you physically, but there's a lot of things that are spiritual. But boy, you say, if I said this outside of this group, if I was in a secular environment and said some sicknesses are spiritual, they're demons, man, I would be, they'd call me a devil. They'd say, I'm demon possessed. Our society does not believe in that. They believe everything has a physical cause and a physical answer. That's what the Bible calls carnal. You are a spiritual being and a lot of what goes on in us is all spiritual. And we are just trying to figure things out in the physical. How do you get out of that? You stick your nose in the Bible that is spirit and it's life. And the more you study the word of God, the word of God makes you spiritually minded. It opens your heart up. It gives you spiritual eyesight. You see things differently than people that don't believe the Bible. The word of God will make you spiritual if you abide in it. Like it says in Joshua chapter one, verse eight, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth but you shall meditate therein day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. The word of God will change your attitude and it will make you prosperous and have good success. I do not believe that you can be a biblical spiritual person without just being consumed by the Bible. I believe you can be a spiritual person demonic spiritual. You can be new age. You can sit in a lotus position and go om, and you can have all kinds of spiritual experiences, but you can't get into God's spirit without going through the word of God. The word of God is a perfect representation of true spiritual things. And if you want to be spiritually minded, you've got, I mean, if you want to be spiritual, you've got to be spiritually minded. Romans chapter eight, verse six says to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Spiritually minded is just word minded. He used the word. He went through all of the Old Testament scriptures and showed them the verses concerning himself. And that's how he began to change their perception. Did you know that Jesus was with them the whole time, but it didn't benefit them because they didn't perceive it. They didn't perceive who he was. Jesus is with us all of the time, but it doesn't always benefit us because we don't perceive it. And why don't we perceive it? Because our eyes are holding, we're carnal, we're operating in our flesh. We're trying to figure things out just in our mind instead of letting God speak to our heart and listening to our heart. How many times have you ever had to make a decision and you had these multiple choices and you felt like you should do something but logic and all of your counselors, every single person told you that stupid, you better do this. And they counseled you to do that. So you made the logical decision and it turned out to be the wrong one. And as soon as it happened, what did you do? I knew I shouldn't have done that. You know what that is? That was your spirit. That was the Holy Spirit trying to lead you and yet we just lean unto our own understanding instead of acknowledging him and believing with our heart. You know, one of the classic examples of this in my life was when I was in Pritchett, Colorado and I pastored that little church. When I went there, they had about four or five elders, but they were all custom combiners and they followed the weed harvest. And so they were there for a few months, but then it was getting towards the time that the weed harvest came up. And so they were all gonna leave and they felt like that they needed to have an elder there to help me run the church. And so they were gonna appoint another elder. And I agreed with that, I didn't have a problem with it. And they all suggested this one guy. And when they uh, suggested him, I said, no, I don't think that's good. I just didn't feel peace about it. I didn't feel like that was the right decision. And you know, I believe that women are more intuitive than men. Men, they just operate out of their logic. And women do a lot of things on feelings and emotions. But being a typical man, uh, you know, I, I didn't have a logical reason not to put him in. I told him, I said, I just don't feel right about it. And they started saying, well, so what's wrong? Well, he was the first guy that embraced Jamie and me when we came. He treated us nice. There was not one 
reason in the natural not to make this guy the elder. It looked good. It was logical. Everything about it was good, but not everything that's good is God. And so anyway, after a week or two, and it was getting close to the deadline when they left, they just pressured me. And I said, all right. So we ordained him, put him in as an elder. They went on weed harvest. And the very first week, this guy turned into the devil personified. <laughs> He said that I was stealing money from the church. He accused me of committing adultery, accused me of doing dope, getting drunk, sexual immorality. I mean, he accused me of everything. He just turned into Satan himself. And when that happened, I said, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. And I drove a stake in the ground right there. And I said, you know what? From now on, I don't care how logical something looks. If I don't bear witness in my heart, if I don't feel peace about it, I'm not going to do it. And I, I probably haven't done that perfectly, but I really can't think of a time I haven't done that since then. I mean, I, to the best of my ability, there's been times when there's no reason I shouldn't do something and I don't do it because I just don't feel like it. I don't feel peace about it. You, you can know things by your heart and the word of God will sensitize you. It'll make you, you'll get to where you perceive things by the word and by what it says and by the spirit when there's no physical proof of anything. For you to dwell in the presence of God, you're going to have to do what this says and you're going to have to go through the scripture and you are going to have to start seeing God with you and seeing how he was with other people. And even when there was things... Uh, going on in the natural. It was what was happening behind the scenes that worked. You know, Jamie and I were in Washington, D.C. a few years back, and I bought the book about Robert, uh, Robert E. Lee, the Confederate uh, head of all of their troops, and I read his book. And it was intriguing to me because the South, for the first two years of the Civil War, the South should have won. They beat the North multiple times. I mean, there was one time where they literally had the northern troops cut off. Lee had given orders that if his orders would have been followed, the South would have won the Civil War. And yet it didn't happen. And it was just miscommunication and one person just refusing to do what he told them to do. Or there was this mistake made or the, or the uh, communication would be changed. by. I mean, it was weird. And it was uh, interesting. But here's what I'm trying to get at. When I read that, I was so disappointed because it's like reading in the Old Testament when people would go out and they would go to a battle and they would have two and three times the force of the enemy. I mean, the enemy would have two and three times as much as them, and yet they would win. And yet the Bible tells you what's going on in the spiritual realm. The reason was because the spirit of God moved when the sound went in the mulberry trees, because an angel went out and killed 145,000 people in one night. See, the Bible not only tells you what happened in the natural, but it shows you what's going on in the spiritual that made these things happen. And as I was reading this book, I just wanted so much to know why did these things fail? Why did it happen this way? It shouldn't have happened that way, and it did. And I just know that in the spiritual realm, it was God moving behind the scenes to make the outcome that we have, but I couldn't tell what it was. They were only telling the things that were going on in the physical. And I thought, man, this is so inferior compared to reading things in the Bible where they give you the spiritual stuff. When you read in the Bible, it'll begin to start showing you what's going on behind the scenes. You'll begin to start seeing things differently. And this is what Jesus did. He referred them to the word. He showed them through the word. The word was spirit and it was life. And it brought them out of their carnal reasonings and began to start having them think spiritually. And then it goes on to say in verse... Uh, 28, it says, and they drew nigh unto the village whither they went and he made as though he would have gone further. And there's a great truth here. I'm not going to elaborate on this, but the Lord does not force himself upon you. You know, my mother always taught me that if somebody asks you over the first time, you always turn it down because if they were serious, they'll ask you again. They might've just been polite. And I'm not sure that that's really the right way to do things. But you know what? It's kind of the principle that the Lord operated on when he went to his disciples. They were out there drowning. You know, he walked on the water to go out and save them. And yet he was out there and yet he would have passed by them if they hadn't yelled at him. 
Man, if it would have been me, I'd have come running, waving my arms. Hold on, guys, I'm coming. But man, he just goes out and shows himself and then he's cool. He just walked right on by the boat. And if they hadn't called out, he would have walked on by right here. He, he made as though he would have gone further and they had to constrain him to come inside. God wants to be wanted. He will not force himself upon you. He's a gentleman. He will reveal himself to you. And, but you have to lay hold of him. You have to say, God, I am not letting you pass by. I'm going to grab hold of these truths. And it says, but they constrained him saying, abide with us for it is toward evening and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them just like he did three days before during the last supper. And I believe that as they, as he did that, you know, it didn't mention that they saw the print of the nails in his hand and yet he was breaking the bread and giving it to them. But it says that he blessed it and break and gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished out of their sight. As soon as they knew him by the spirit, as soon as they finally perceived by the spirit who this was instantly, he was gone. You know what? Knowing God by the spirit is better than knowing him by the flesh. And again, most of us would say, oh no, I want to see him. I want to have the glory cloud. I want to see something. It's a greater faith to operate in knowing him by the spirit. And the moment that they got into the spirit, the moment they knew who he was, he was gone. Do you know, God's with us and we wished we could see more and feel this and have a goose bump. And oh God, you know, I heard Kenneth Hagin talk about that. He had fire jump between his hands when he laid his hands on a person. And we want these physical things and stuff. And God can do that. He does do it. He has done it. But the greatest faith is when you just operate in faith. As soon as they saw him, they vanished out of sight. And it says how that he was made known unto them. In, in breaking of bread. Let's go on and read this. In verse 32, it says, And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? Man, that is one powerful scripture. Jeremiah said something similar in Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. He was so, he had been persecuted so much, thrown in prison, beaten and all these things. He says, I'm not going to speak anymore in the name of the Lord. I'm not going to say this anymore. He got tired of being persecuted. But he says, but his word was like fire shut up in my bones and I couldn't forbear. I tell you what, the word of God, some of you have, know what I'm talking about. Others here may have never experienced this. But I've seen my son raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open. I've seen many, many miracles. The greatest thing that has ever happened to me in my life is the word of God just coming alive and God speaking to you and having God's word burn in your heart. It's awesome. If you have never experienced that, you are missing out on what I consider to be the greatest thing. I tell you, the word of God coming alive on the inside of you is absolutely awesome. Everything you see right here is because of the word of God burning in my heart. That's awesome. They said, didn't his word burn within us? And they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the 11 gathered together and them that were with them saying, the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared unto Simon. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. It's in communion that your eyes get opened and that you really see the Lord. You have to have the foundation of the word of God. You got to have this word burning within you. But then it's as you take what the word is revealed to you and you commune with God and you talk to him and you speak back to him his word. And you say, Father, thank you that you're with me. Thank you that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. It's as you're in communion with him that your spiritual eyes are open and that you actually make connection with him. Well, that is powerful. And brothers and sisters, there's just a lack of communion with God. Most of the time we're operating in our flesh and we do so many things that just heighten our flesh. 
that lock us into the physical natural realm and make us spiritually dull. We need to reverse this. We need to get to where we are letting the word dwell in us richly, where the word of God is burning in our heart. We are spending time, quality and quantity time, just fellowshipping with God. And it's through this communion and fellowship that your spiritual eyes get open and you'll begin to start seeing things. You can see things by the spirit better than you can see them by the natural. I know some of you, and again, I'm not saying this to put anybody down, but there's many people here that what I'm saying may sound good, but it's just like another world. It's, it, you don't live that way. And that's the reason that we aren't experiencing greater things of God because we don't dwell in the secret place. We don't dwell in his presence. We just go there every once in a while. But as a whole, we let our carnal man blind us and hold our eyes and keep us from seeing God. And I'm telling you, you can totally reverse this. Based on the scripture we've already used, God is always with us. That is never the problem. It's always our perception. That's the problem. And you control your perception. Or let me say it this way. You can control your perception 100%. Most of us don't. Most of us let other things. You know, the illustration Barry gave through neglect, we just let the cares of this life and all of these things grow up in us and we let other things happen. But the truth is you have the ability to grab control and you can perceive God as much as you want to perceive him. You can have as much joy as you want to have. You can have as much anointing, as much power, as much victory as you want to have. It's all here. It's all in us. And if we aren't experiencing it, it's not because we haven't prayed enough and begged God enough. It's not because we aren't living holy enough. It's just because we've let our heart become hardened. We've let these other things grab our attention. Our focus is held by all of these other things and we have to reverse it. Amen. So I've just now laid a good foundation for everything I want to say this week. Amen. I still got four times left, so we got a lot to work with. Praise God. Father, we love you and we thank you for the word of God. Thank you for these illustrations. Thank you for recording these things so that we could see how people who knew you in the natural and knew you intimately didn't even recognize you because you were spiritually discerned. And Father, I pray that tonight you help us to recognize that the problem isn't with you. The problem is our blindness, hardness of heart that blinds us to things. And Father, tonight we repent of those things and we want to be in your presence. We want to experience and understand your presence. We want our eyes open to your presence. Father, we want to dwell there. We want to get to where we know you more than we know the physical, natural things. Father, we want to know who we are in Christ more than we know who we are in ourself, in our physical realm. Father, we thank you. And I believe that through the word that I've shared tonight, that Father, that word is going to burn on the inside of people. And that Father, that you will reveal yourself to people. Praise you, Father. I just hear the Lord saying right now that there's many people that you just felt like God is far away. And God's been speaking to you throughout this entire conference and showing you that he's been with you every step of the way. God has never been far away. It was you that felt like he was far away because your eyes were held by other things that you were thinking and considering. But right now, God is just ministering to you and ministering comfort to you. Those times where you felt like God forsook you and that you were on your own, you were never on your own. Things would have been much, much worse if God hadn't have been there to help you. Well, the Lord is just ministering his love and comfort, faithfulness to people. There's some of you felt like God failed you, that something you believed for didn't work and you just feel like God failed. God never has failed anybody. It's impossible for God to fail. It was just us it, because of our own flesh and limitations. We just weren't able to receive. There's no condemnation with that, but don't blame God. Thank you, Father, 
Father, we receive this word. Father, I believe that you are touching hearts right now and healing them of hurts and things that they've had, that they've inflicted on themselves because of the way that they've thought. Father, I believe that you are healing people's hearts right now. I thank you that you're healing people's bodies. Father, thank you for touching people right now. Thank you, Jesus. Marriages are being restored. People are beginning to see their mate by the spirit instead of by the flesh and just looking on the physical, natural things. If you'll get to where you know them by their heart, it would change your attitude towards them. 